I always enjoy the music that they choose. I, don't, I didn't have a, a hand in that, so I really love the great care that they take in thinking through the scripture that we're studying together and then um, being able to just share in the worship of that. And, and those are just beautiful lyrics. I love that hymn. I also love that you all get to mix in with those missionary kids. One of, one of the great joys I have of being a professor is I get those missionary kids in my classes, and um, I love them so much, and I think the parents love knowing that I keep a, an eye on them, <laughs> um, but I love them. So anyway, welcome back. We are on Hebrews 12, that's right, 18 to 29, and so... We will um, just enjoy that, and thank, thankful to my daughter who helped me <laughs> with those slides up there. But anyway, um, let me just pray for us one more time, and then we will get started as you're getting out all your notes and everything. Father, thank you again for just this opportunity that you've given us to open up your word, Father God, and just to be blessed by all that you've bestowed upon us in Christ Jesus. How can we, Lord, not be eternally grateful for what you've done? For we know that this blessing of salvation that you've given us is unearned and undeserved. And yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ came to die for us. And so we're thankful. And this morning, I just pray that as I open up the word with these ladies once again, that you'll be glorified in all of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah. Well, in Pilgrim's Progress... We encounter a pivotal moment along Christian's journey when he meets a fellow traveler named Faithful. And their encounter marks a poignant moment of camaraderie and shared experiences as they journey as pilgrims towards the New Jerusalem. And together, they joyously recount the challenges that they faced from Navigating the city of destruction to dealing with companions like Pliable. Yet it is Faithful's recounting of his own trials that truly highlights the diverse nature of the pilgrim's journey. For instance, he shares with um, Christian his experience with Wanton, who was a temptress offering fleeting pleasures and his, then his perilous confrontation that he had with Adam the first at the, at the Hill of Difficulty. And through these, experience, uh, through these experiences, Faithful grapples with just the allure of worldly temptations symbolized by that first Adam's deceitful offers. And what stands out is that Faithful has resilience in the face of temptation. His discernment um, exemplified by the revelation of of the put off the old man with his deeds. I don't know if you remember that in the story, but it's inscribed in the Adam the first forehead. It really underscores the importance of spiritual discernment as we uh, just go along life's treacherous paths, right? Furthermore, in that uh, wonderful story that we have, um, Faithful's encounter with Adam the first unveils a deeper truth about law and grace. Christian reveals to Faithful that Adam the first is actually a representation of Moses, and it's bound by rigidity of the law without the capacity for grace. And so as we wrap up Hebrews 12 this morning, let us observe how the preacher echoes really the same truth in verses 18 to 29. He really underscores the fundamental choice between the way of law and the way of grace, the way of judgment of one's own work and the redemptive work of Christ, the way of man and the way of God. So following the same pattern in our first point, we will see contrasts of both the Old Covenant, right, and the New Covenant, both represented really both by Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. But really what the author is arguing for in this entire letter, quite frankly, is the greatness of Christ in every single avenue in our life. And of course, this section is no different And so that brings us to our first point, which is the supremacy of the new covenant. The supremacy of the new covenant. 
I would even say on the road to glory by his grace. On the road to glory. Um, let's begin. I, I need to give a little bit of context uh, just to kind of get us settled before we kind of get into it, because maybe some of you weren't here last week. But if you were, you will recall that last week we highlighted the perseverance and the commitment that is demanded of believers in the Christian faith, particularly in the face of adversity. That section of Hebrews 12 vividly compared the Christian journey to a race, right? And it was urging us as believers to shed things like hindrances in our life and the sin that clings so closely to run with endurance and to fix our focus on Jesus as the ultimate leader of the race of faith. And despite the remarkable examples that we have of faith recounted for us in chapter 11, the author really emphasizes to us in chapter 12 that Jesus remains the better focus and the better leader of our journey. Moreover, uh, last week's lessons illuminated how trials encountered in our Christian pilgrimage serve as opportunities, right? They're not hindrances, but they're opportunities <laughs> for our growth and confirmation of our relationship with God. God's discipline that's fueled by his love is aimed for our benefit and for his glory. And so believers are called to respond with gratitude towards his training, shunning any temptation that we might have towards despair and certainly the sin of unbelief. In fact, as children of God, what we learned is that humility must pervade our hearts with our chief ambition to please God and steadfastly fulfill our commitments to him. So I think last week's lesson in particular really underscored just that dedication we have because we're in Christ to upright living. And that's marked really by this idea of perseverance and sort of a forward focus and, of course, an obedience to God. So now we're going to transition from the call to action, verses 1 to 17, to the exhortations here in verses 18 to 29. And we're going to contrast the, the law, which is the old way, or we would say represented by Mount Sinai, and grace which is Mount Zion, the new way, and so forth. And in this passage, the Hebrew writer is going to employ for us a historical narrative, something you're familiar with, I'm sure, but he's using that as a way to powerfully illustrate just the importance of perseverance in our pressing forward in our Christian pilgrimage and, and really just the danger of turning back, Right? This section of Hebrews um, actually is widely regarded by commentators as the sermon's pinnacle, really reinforcing the message of perseverance in the faith. Perseverance. So follow along. I'm going to read 18 to 24 to get us started here. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words, which sound, uh, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So wonderful. We can really kind of approach this passage in kind of two paragraphs, as I was saying before. You can approach it like the old way, or what was, and you can approach it and the new way, or what lies ahead to the finish line. You can kind of think of it that way. These also represent, I would say, two experiences 
that the original audience felt upon hearing this sermon for the first time, yet, as you probably discovered in your own study, they really resonate with us in our own lives, doesn't it? And so we too often, I think, um, even in our life now, we too often look over our shoulder and we too often look back to what is familiar. So this is encouraging us. So to begin, the author states in verse 18, for you have not come, for you have not come. This phrase actually was frequently used in Hebrews, um, and it really, in all those other instances, was really directing believers towards Christ, urging them to draw near to God, to avoid drifting away from him. But in this instance, the phrase is used to underscore what believers are not encountering on their pilgrimage and the potential consequences if they were to abandon the faith. In other words, the audience here, or excuse me, the author here is reminding his audience that their journey does not lead to Mount Sinai, the site where the law that Moses um, gave. So what do we know about Mount Sinai? Well, um, one thing we know is that it's also known as Horeb, Another name for it. We know that it held significance in Israel's history as the site of profound encounters with God. We think of Moses' encounter with the burning bush, right? We think of um, the giving of the Ten Commandments. And other cultures during that time, they would have seen mountains as magical realms of, of deities, but the Israelites understood that their God who resided in heaven, only manifested his presence on this mountain during very significant moments in their history. And so the Hebrew author is trying to bring to mind to the original audience, he's trying to bring them to this pivotal moment of their history to really remind them of just the magnitude of that experience. And this reminder is particularly important because Faced with the the fear of persecution and suffering, the Hebrew believers are actually tempted to revert back to to what they feel is comfortable, back to the familiar confines of Judaism, thinking that it's going to be safer, (laughs) right? And that's amazing. And so he does this wonderful thing where he recalls something that they would be so familiar with. However, um, what we learn is such a a disposition of unbelief and fear actually risks obscuring the surpassing greatness of Christ's promises and hope. So the author is attempting to give him a little bit of a reality check by going over what was, paraphrasing this historical account um, from Exodus 19, which of course is the account of that earthly mountain that actually could be physically touched, right? It could be. And if, if, if you were with us a few years ago, we studied the Pentateuch. Maybe you've studied Exodus on your own. Maybe you studied it with us. But in each case, you know, what you learn is that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt to the wilderness of Sinai, where God proposed a covenant relationship with them, setting them apart as his special possession. And it was there that the Lord instructed Moses about his descent upon Mount Sinai in a thick cloud, promising an awe-inspiring encounter. And to prepare for this, if you recall, the people had to consecrate themselves, remember? And what that highlights for us, and they were actually to refrain from touching the mountain too, but what that highlights for us is God's holiness, right? God's holiness and really just the gravity of approaching God at all, right? So the law which was the Ten Commandments, which is really a summary of all that is in the law, was ultimately given to the people, but it was given to them through Moses at Mount Sinai. And while the law is not inherently bad, of course, because after all, it's God's revelation of himself, it lacked direct access to God. Okay? So in Moses' day, only he could approach God on behalf of the people And, of course, we know as we kind of follow the timeline that later it was succeeded by the priests and the high priests through the Levitical system, but only once a year. It wasn't a finished work, right? Kept going on and on. And that point is crucial. 
Because the audience to whom the preacher is addressing must take a step back and they must remind themselves that back then, to approach God meant to stand in fear for one's life, dwelling in darkness and in gloom. Furthermore, it really led to a form of religious slavery. This is best illustrated by Paul in Galatians 4.24, where he employs an allegory um, featuring two mothers, Sarah and Hagar. I should say it the other way around, Hagar and Sarah. And they symbolize two distinct covenants, Mount Sinai, which represents the covenant that could only produce offspring destined for bondage, and Mount Zion, representing the covenant of grace sealed in the blood of Christ, offering genuine freedom from sin and death. And so, really, the Hebrew preacher's primary aim in recounting these awe-inspiring signs given at Mount Sinai was really just to show us the absolute unapproachability of God at that time. Why? Because he is holy, 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 right? Holy. And so consequently, sinful humanity could not draw near to God and survive. Even Moses, who was permitted to ascend the mountain, trembled in what? He trembled in fear. So the law was there to demonstrate the need to access God, yet it could not provide it. So it just demonstrates the need. Instead, what it actually highlights is this vast gulf between humanity's sinfulness and God's holiness. But by God's grace, the believers then, the believers today, we haven't come to this mountain, ladies. We haven't come, but we have come to the joy of Mount Sinai, or Sinai, Mount Zion, symbolizing the covenant of grace, or we could say the new way, the new way. Beginning in verse 22, we see that the Hebrew preacher uses con that conjunction, the word but. And if you've had any kids watch Schoolhouse Rock, this is what my kids learn, right? Conjunction, junction, what is your function, right? I would have sung it for you, but I didn't want to embarrass myself. But here we learn that it means not this, Mount Sinai, but this. Mount Zion, okay? The conjunction but is a marker of contrast. The Hebrew believers have not come to Mount Sinai, but they have come to Mount Zion. And the original audience would have understood that Mount Zion had prominence during King David's reign. Uh, Psalm 50 verse 2 brings this out. It says, from Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. So they would have understood that this is not a mountain of darkness and gloom, but this is a mountain of light and hope. In fact, the Zion of Isaiah's prophetic vision is part of the narrative of God's unfolding plan, a plan that, culminate, uh, that culminates in the establishment of a future kingdom, praise the Lord. And in our text, Mount Zion represents just that. Mount Zion represents the heavenly Jerusalem, which is emblematic of the new covenant, of the new covenant. In contrast to the tangible yet unapproachable nature of Sinai, which symbolizes the law, Mount Zion represents the better place where grace is offered through the new covenant. And this shift in verse 22 from law to grace is very pivotal and it really echoes important truths throughout Scripture, but one I was thinking of was like um, Romans 3.28, where Paul talks about salvation um, not being attained through adherence to the law, but actually through the boundless grace of God through what? Through Christ's finished work alone, right? Mount Zion, therefore, serves as a beacon of hope for believers then and now, signifying our ultimate destination which is the heavenly city, which is where Christ is worshipped in eternal celebration. And we should all have big smiles on our face when I say that, right? Because that's where we're going. Here, believers have come to a mountain um, where fear and sorrow are replaced by unrestrained worship and joy, 
really emphasizing the superiority of the new covenant over the old. And in essence, the pilgrim's journey to the joy of Mount Sinai, uh, Mount Zion, I'm going to get these words confused constantly, <clears throat> is intricately linked with the embrace of the covenant of grace, where we find forgiveness, and we find atonement, and we find salvation. And that is a truth that underscores the, the, just the surpassing excellence of the new covenant. And as our pastor says, coming to Christ is coming to Zion, which is reflective of heaven. Now let's delve a little bit deeper into the descriptors of Mount Zion as outlined for us in our text. Firstly, we see that the preacher aptly depicts Mount Zion as the city of the living God. The city of the living God. And that designation really underscores its origin, its divine origin. This is actually the city that Abraham looked for, whose very architect and builder is none other than God himself. In this city, believers are not merely inhabitants, but they're esteemed citizens sharing in the same community as saints of old. It is the holy city. It is the new Jerusalem that's prophesied to descend from heaven, meticulously prepared as the eternal dwelling place for the bride of Christ. It is the celestial abode where the one true God reigns supreme. And although the believer is not there yet, we're kind of in an already but not yet stage, aren't we? We're not there yet, but you know what? It's our inheritance, and it is undefiled, it is unfading, and it is kept in heaven for you. Can you get excited about that? That's... Therefore, even when we are faced with trial and tribulation, one must not lose heart or shrink back or even give up. For their momentary light affliction is working out for them an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparisons as the believer fixes their gaze, not on things that are seen, oh no, but on, which those things are temporary, but on the things which are unseen. That, ladies, is eternal. That's eternal. In other words, believer, in the midst of your storm, my encouragement to you is to maintain an eternal perspective. Even though your circumstances may be challenging this side of heaven, just as they were for the Hebrew believers, by application, this eternal reality is really meant to encourage your hearts, um, especially just in your suffering, and to really exhort you just to persevere and to press on and to really press on towards the finish line. Secondly, when we come to Mount Zion, it's adorned with myriads of angels, and they're joyfully exalting the Lamb of God, and it just contributes to this amazing divine atmosphere of worship and adoration. And then we find out in verse 23, alongside them, um, there's going to be an assembly of the church of the firstborn who are the believers of both the living and the dead who receive their inheritance all of whom bear the distinction of having their names dis, um, inscribed in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. And this truth echoes the sentiment expressed in Hebrews 2.12, where the author was quoting Psalm 21, verse 23, and he's really just emphasizing the exaltation of God's name within the assembly or the ecclesia. It's just a, the, another name for church, Right? And just this harmonious praise that's just resounding throughout. Can you picture it in your mind? Thirdly, when you come to Mount Zion, you also come to a city of God who judges all. This aspect holds profound significance. For arriving at Mount Zion means that we are entering the very presence of God himself. It is a pivotal moment to grasp, especially when you Consider the contrast with Mount Sinai. There, God was unapproachable. But here, we can come before his throne to worship with confidence because of Christ and his finished work. And of course, in Christ, you can do that now. You can do that now. Now, to a Jew who was only acquainted with the God of Sinai, this concept of approaching 
Mount Zion and the way that I'm, I'm speaking would have been somewhat utterly mind-bending for them. However, the emphasis here is the mountain they now stand on is not the same as before. It's not the same. Meaning the way into God's eternal presence has been graciously opened for those who place their trust in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. That is the rock of their foundation. It's not built on sand. It's built on the rock, right? That is the confidence that all believers have. Stepping into God's holy presence at Sinai spelled certain death, yet the arrival of Zion brings life, brings life. And this juxtaposition highlights this transformative power of Christ's sacrifice which not only redeems, but it also reconciles humanity with their creator. And so in embracing the new covenant, believers are invited into a relationship with a God who does judge all things, but he does so with mercy and with grace. And so coming to Mount Zion signifies not only a journey into divine presence, but you need to understand it's also a transition from condemnation to life. There, therefore, is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. you understand that? It's really good news. We have gone from fear to ultimate hope here. That's where he's taking us. Fourth, the believer has also come to a mountain where the spirits of the righteous will be made perfect. This is talking about the faithful saints, whom the, the author has already alluded to in chapter 11. Saints like Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Abel and Noah and Moses and David, all others and others who have just waited for the perfection that we've already received. They are the ones who exemplify those who did not receive the promise. While many promises of God were fulfilled in their lifetime, they didn't get to witness that great, the great promise, namely um, just the coming of Messiah and salvation in him. They passed away before Jesus appeared, entering heaven with that promise unfulfilled. They were saved, but, not, but only after Jesus' work on the cross could salvation be perfected, okay? And according to Hebrews 11, verse 40, they had to wait for Christ's death and resurrection to be glorified or made complete. And someday, ladies, we will be with them in heaven worshiping. Can you imagine? That's amazing. We're going to be worshiping Christ together. Um, some commentators believe that this is also a reference to some of the martyrs in uh, Revelation 6, 9 and 11. Finally, uh, we reach the climax of, the first, of our first point, and that is, according to verse 24, when we come to Mount Zion, we come face to face with Jesus. He is the supreme mediator of a better and everlasting covenant. It's note, noteworthy to observe once again, as we highlighted last week, that the author employs his personal name again for Jesus, um, which in the Hebrew means Jehovah is salvation. And this choice emphasizes not only his humanity, but also his redemptive mission. So, when we approach Mount Zion, we also encounter the sprinkling of his atoning blood through which we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which, by the way, he has lavished upon the believer, according to Ephesians 1.7. Moreover, those who are sprinkled by his blood are chosen by God the Father according to his foreknowledge, and they are sanctified by the work of the Spirit and called to obediently follow Jesus Christ. This blood sacrifice far surpasses that of Abel, who offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. And though Abel's offering of the firstborn of his flock was regarded by Yahweh, it lacked the saving power found only in the blood of Jesus. Abel's sacrifice indeed was acceptable, but it wasn't able to provide full atonement. Conversely, then, Jesus' blood sacrifice is sufficient to redeem and to reconcile all believers to God the Father. And I know some of you took a different view, and I'll talk about it. Some of you might think, well, isn't that talking about Abel's blood when he died is crying out for vengeance in contrast to Christ's blood? 
Well, I, and actually Pastor John don't take that view, but even if you do, I don't want you to miss the point, because that's not the point. The point is, and the emphasis here is on Jesus and his once-for-all blood sacrifice that holds continuing significance for the worship of God's people in the heavenly Jerusalem. It is only through Jesus' blood that believers find forgiveness and redemption and restoration and the assurance of eternal life, a reality that distinguishes the new covenant as superior and everlasting, and that brings us on the road to glory by his grace, which also brings us to the second point, which is the glorious accountability of a new covenant. The glorious accountability of the new covenant. And let me go ahead and read verses 25 to 29 now. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape in turning away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that these things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God in acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Well, Hebrews 12, 25 marks a significant shift. And it's signaling a transition from discussing what God has done to emphasizing what believers should do in response. This is what God has done, so in light of what he's done, this is how we are to respond. This change is marked by an imperative tone, and it just really urges readers to consider their response to these theophanies, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, and the preacher's solemn admonition here is, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. It is not a mere caution, ladies, against returning to the old ways, but it is a call to active attention and obedience to God's voice. Notice how he uses that phrase once again, see to it. We saw that before last week. But what he means here is watch out, pay attention, make sure you do not refuse him that is speaking. This verse carries the weight of history drawing a parallel between the consequences faced by the unbelieving Israelites at Mount Sinai and those who disregard God's voice from heaven, specifically from Mount Zion. The clause, if they did not escape, what that implies is they did not escape. (laughs) They did not escape. And the imperfect tense implies that attempts were made to escape, but they did not escape. So the argument asserts that if those who rejected the earthly warning did not escape, then it follows with even greater certainty that we could not evade judgment if we reject the divine warning from heaven. At Mount Sinai, God communicated through Moses imparting the Ten Commandments to guide his people towards righteous living. But now at Mount Zion, he speaks through his son, and he speaks a superior word. And despite the shift in communication methods, it's it's important to note that the word of God itself remains unchanging, right? And it demands our utmost attention and our utmost reverence. That sober admonition in verse 25, it's, it's meant to do something to you. And it was meant to do something to the original audience. It's meant to stir emotion in your heart, deep emotions. It's meant to stir memories in the Hebrew believers. And it's meant to lay the groundwork for understanding the present-day mode of God's communication with his people, which is through his son, through his word. And really the key to grasping the depth of verse 25 is just recognizing the weight behind the term refuse which goes beyond just passive rejection. In this, what he means in this way is it implies that you are actively seeking excuses to avoid heeding God's message, okay? 
This warning echoes the gravity emphasized in Hebrews 10, 28 to 29, where those who disregarded the law of Moses, they, they faced merciless death, we know that, um, and, and punishment, severe punishment. But there is even more of a severity of punishment intensified for those that trample the Son of God and really treating as ordinary the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and thereby really insulting the spirit of grace. So for believers who are tempted to shrink back as they face suffering and persecution, verse 25 is urging them just to persevere and to have vigilance against that allure of evading obedience to God's word. Because you know how it is, you're suffering and you shrink back and you withdraw and all of that. And so he's calling for you not to do that. He's calling you to be steadfast in your endurance in this race of faith that we're on, even amidst the distractions and just really the competing voices of the world. And just as the Hebrew believers face pressures from the Roman government and their Jewish peers, modern believers who encounter their own challenges, um, the call is, is, is it's just unchanged. We've, we've got to attentively listen to God's voice through his word. It's kind of a non-negotiable commitment. So we remain resolute in that obedience to Christ. Believers are called to honor the Lord as they journey to the city of the living God. But similarly, this is a sobering warning for unbelievers, right? And it's equally urgent in its message. Just as those who disregarded God's voice at Sinai were barred from entering the promised land, so too those who reject his voice through his son. They will be ex excluded from entering the heavenly promised land, often referred to as the New Jerusalem. So it's crucial to grasp that one's eternal destiny really hinges on their response to the voice of the one who speaks from heaven. Therefore, we are called to heed that warning and make sure that you do not refuse him who is speaking. So just as Hebrews 12, 25 underscores the severity of disregarding God's voice, verse 26 really begins to expand on this warning with just a vivid image of divine judgment. And as we learned from the previous passage in Exodus 19 at Sinai, God's voice shook the earth. <laughs> It shook the earth, but from Mount, Sinai, Mount Zion, he is going to shake the very heavens, which is representative of the entire universe. Here, the Hebrew author not only employs intense imagery to emphasize the magnitude of God's judgment when Christ returns a second time, but he also alludes to a prophecy that's found in Haggai 2, verse 6. In Haggai's post-exilic context, they were dealing with the loss of the temple um, due to the Babylonian destruction, which really kind of served as a painful metaphor for the spiritual failures of the nation and really the moral condition of the community. However, God's message through Haggai was one of restoration. It was one of renewal, as, he tells as God tells the people just to finish building the temple. Um, because that's what God wants you to do. So just finish. In Haggai chapters 1 and 2, Yahweh encourages the leaders to be strong, not to fear, reminding them of his covenant with their forefathers at Mount Sinai and his presence among them, declaring to them once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and also the dry land. A little bit more emphasis in Haggai. <laughs> And this shaking extends really to all nations. And it's, it's symbolizing for us just this sort of universal upheaval. Haggai's immediate context may have pertained to the imminent collapse of the Persian Empire, but we can't help but notice that the language carries sort of this es eschatological or just the end of all things language. And it really hints at the anticipation of the messianic age. And that's significant. Um, because the Hebrew author attaches that meaning to verse 26. He's thinking, Jesus' return in view. Jesus is coming back, right? And he's going to establish his millennial kingdom. And aren't we thankful that we're learning about that on Sunday right now? So it really ties in with what we're learning. 
When Jesus comes back, it is at that time that everything physical, those things which can be shaken, will be destroyed, and only the eternal things will remain. This truth is, we see it all over scripture, but I think of 2 Peter 3.10, which describes the day of the Lord as coming like a thief, with the heavens passing away, with a roar, and the elements being destroyed with intense heat. Peter's referring to that ultimate moment when God will initiate a complete overhaul of the infrastructure. Said another way, when everything is said and done, this big shakeup is like that final exam before God's ultimate plan kicks in, which is a brand new heaven and earth. I had to throw that in there because I have students that are heading towards finals right now. But honestly, this truth should not have been something new to the ears of the Hebrew believers who know the scriptures because it's actually reminiscent of, of places like Psalm 102, 26 to 28, where the suffering psalmist recognizes God as creator of the earth and the heavens, affirming that while everything else may wear out and change, God himself remains unchanged and enduring. Therefore, the psalmist expresses confidence in God's everlasting promises and his presence that the descendants of God's servants will also continue and be established before him. And that, ladies, is a promise for us as well. That's why it's so encouraging. This aligns with Hebrews 12, 27, and just that repeated phrase, yet once more, the, the concept of what can be shaken, it just refers to the material universe, which are just the created things. That, and the purpose of the removing is just clear so that what cannot be shaken, that's what remains, right? And so in summary, the Hebrew preacher is just emphasizing in his sermon that the things which can be shaken are rendered insecure, implying that they're going to be cast down or shaken from a sense of security, but the kingdom that the believer has cannot be shaken, cannot be shaken. It is a kingdom that believers receive with security and with joy. It is a lasting city that we're seeking, the city which is to come. It is a city of the living God, thus our eyes are to be fixed on that firm foundation, knowing that the things which can be shaken will be destroyed, and the only things that will remain will be God's kingdom, which will stand permanent, and that for us possesses eternal stability. So therefore, verse 28, because we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that will endure, which by the way is in the present tense, what heart attitude should follow? How should I then respond to this truth, to this rich theology that I know? For this undeserved, incredible blessings that we've received in Christ, how should we then respond? What's our response, ladies? That's right. Our response should be twofold, because we've already talked about one, obedience. But secondly, it should be one of giving thanksgiving to the Lord. The preacher uses the word charis for, for thanksgiving, and normally that would be translated grace, but in this context it's translated thanksgiving. So how might we express that kind of gratitude? Well, the preacher continues to guide the way. He says that we are to offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, in other words, the right response to receiving an unshakable kingdom is a life of worship, a life of worship. That is a life that is dedicated to offering holy service to our holy, 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 worthy, awesome God. The use of the term worship in the context of this sermon indicates the author is expressing the notion of serving God as priests in a spiritual sense. And we know that from other places in Scripture, don't we? That we who have tasted the kindness of the Lord and have come to Christ as a living stone, as those living stones were being built up into a priesthood. And so now we continually offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Christ. And you're going to see that later because it's in Hebrews 13, verse 5, where he says, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Worship with reverence and awe are really linked with the fact that our God is a consuming fire. 
which is, which is stated in verse 29. What an amazing concluding thought. Um, because it takes the original audience um, back to Sinai, actually. <laughs> it takes them more specifically back to Deuteronomy 4, where Moses reminded the second generation to listen to God, which does not just mean hear or know, but to do. To do the statutes and the judgments that he gave them so that they may go in and take possession of the land, of the promised land. They were exhorted to hold fast to the Lord and keep his word. And when they did, the nation surrounding them would see that they were a great nation who was wise and they served a God who was near. They were also to remember the day they stood before the Lord at Horeb and came near to God and they stood at the foot of the mountain and they were to learn how to fear the Lord. Deuteronomy 4.23 ends with a very similar warning to the Hebrew warning, which is to watch yourself carefully and do not act corruptly like the first generation did and make idols for themselves, thereby forgetting the covenant of the Lord. For the essence of the covenant is the truth that there is only one true God, the Lord, and the recognition and worship of any other created thing is nothing more than treason. Right? As such, it demands and it deserves the judgment of divine wrath, that of a jealous God who is a consuming fire. Ladies, it's essential to grasp that the God revealed at Sinai and the God reigning in Zion are one and the same. He is holy. He is sovereign. He is unchanging. And as his people, we must diligently focus on the aspect of this character alongside celebrating grace. We are to fear the Lord even today, is what I'm saying. Reverence and awe. Our reverence for the Lord must remain steadfast, for he remains a consuming fire deserving of our worship and awe. Moreover, as we anticipate Jesus' glorious return, we must recognize that God's holiness will purify all that is evil um, and all that is false, and those who are entrenched in wickedness will face judgment by the fire of his holiness. So today, our obedience, our thankfulness, our worship must authentically reflect our confession. And what is that confession? Just an unwavering commitment to God with reverence and awe through Christ our Lord. So in conclusion, let us just draw inspiration from that enduring allegory that I started with, Pilgrim's Progress, penned by John Bunyan during his 12 years of imprisonment, okay? Through Bunyan's earthly journey, um, his earthly journey, it ended at 62. That's only two years from, from me. But his timeless wisdom within his book really mirrors what we've learned in Hebrews 12 over the last two weeks. Like Bunyan's character, Christian, we encounter trials and tribulation in our pilgrimage from the slow of despond to doubting castle. Each test, um, just, it, each time it just tests our resolve and it really tempts us to look back. Yet amid those challenges, Hebrews 12 illuminates a really important truth for us that believers are to have that, that believers have received an unshakable kingdom secured by the finished work of Christ, his death on the cross, his atonement for our sin, and his resurrection according to the scriptures. And so, dear sisters in Christ, until we reach our heavenly home, may we journey with unwavering faith like those who walked before us, fixing our gaze on Christ, our King our mediator, and when we reach the gates of the celestial city, may we hear the joyful proclamation, say it with me, well done, my good and faithful servant. And for those who are wavering and unsure about your life in Christ, may this be the day of your salvation. God is calling you from heaven, so listen to his voice. His word is near to you. Don't refuse his voice. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I pray that today you will become one of the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, eternally worshiping the king in reverence and in awe. All right, let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for our unshakable kingdom, secured by Christ alone, who lived the perfect life that we should have lived, who died the death that we deserved. It was, Lord, a better sacrifice. And may we this morning just really understand the gravity of that truth and really respond with worship in our hearts. Lord, you are holy, holy, holy. And yet, because of Christ, we can actually approach your throne of grace with confidence, asking for mercy and grace in our time of need. And so we're thankful, and we love you, Lord, and we want to be an obedient and thankful people, Lord. Help us. We hear your word, and we want so, so desperately to respond accordingly. And may you receive the honor and the glory that's due your name. Amen.